but we're going to talk about MAT structure and function. <laughs> and um, a couple of uh, just sort of general announcements. Um, I am, I, I, my usual goal for grading is a week. Um, I'm we're still working on the exams. There is a part of me that's like, oh, because it's a week and we have break, I have like extra time. I should be chill. And part of me is like, but if I got it done before break, then I could like not do it during break. Um, so we're on the fence about how hard I'm going to push myself for Friday or not. Um, so just so you are aware, if you look at the schedule um, after break, um, you see that we are having a paper discussion about um, antigen presentation on the Wednesday after break. Um, that paper, as well as the questions that are due that day, are already posted. So you are well aware to do that. Um, there's also an MHC antigen presentation problem set that's due after break, and that is also already posted. Um, so anything that you need for that week after break is already up. Um, and uh, I may even like get a little further ahead with some of the assignments um, at some point as well. But that right now, everything you need for after break is already posted and ready to go. Um, so we are going to continue thinking about MHC um, today. Remember that we talked about all of this is sort of in service of us thinking about T cells and the T cell receptor and how we activate a T cell. Um, but we talked about the fact that the antigen that is seen by the T cell is actually the MHC molecule plus a peptide from a microbe. And the T cell receptor needs to see the correct MHC as well as the correct peptide in order for recognition to occur. So the MHCs are restricted um, in that they will only recognize the correct antigen peptide when it is presented on the appropriate MHC. Um, we also talked about the fact that the MHC genes, so the genes encoding this MHC protein, are the most polymorphic genes in the human genome. Um, so there are the largest number of different versions of these, of any gene in the genome. So you can see, for example, HLA-B has 3,700 versions, and that was that's certainly out of date because we're finding new ones all the time, um, which means that we each have probably different HLA-As, Bs, and Cs, um, and we each probably have two copies, one from our mom, one from our dad, that are all different. So for um, MHC class 1, which is A, B, and C, we probably have six versions, each of us. Um, for DP, DQ, DR, again, we may very well have six versions, each of us, different ones from our mom and our dad. Um, and we mentioned that this is something that's really important in transplantation. When we're doing transplant matching, we are actually trying to match you to a donor who has the same MHC types as you. And so you may now suddenly have a greater understanding of how challenging it can be to find an appropriate match for transplantation. Um, and we also talked about the fact that um, the differences between these different MHC molecules really are centered on this pocket that binds to the peptide. So what you might imagine is if we had a different MHC that wasn't the mint green one, um, this pocket would be slightly differently shaped. And so perhaps the little circly amino acid at position like two-ish, I'm guessing that's position amino acid number two in this peptide. Um, you know, this MHC can bind any peptide that has circle amino acid at number two. But a different one might have a shape where it binds a square at position number five. Like the shape of this pocket might be different. And so a different set of peptides could be presented. And we talked about the fact that um, we each have, you know, these six uh, class ones, six class twos on the surface of our cells that are being codominantly expressed. They each have those slightly different pocket shapes, um, which allow them to present slightly different peptides. So each of us can probably, if when we chop up the proteins from a particular microbe, each of us can probably present at least one peptide 
from that microbe. At least one of the many, many, many peptides that come from that microbe will fit one of our six MHC plus ones, but we're all likely presenting a slightly different peptide. That means that we're going to make a slightly different T cell response because the T cell is responding to the MHC plus peptide, and that T cell response might be better or worse. And so the specific MHC type that we have may dictate, will dictate whether or not we have a particularly severe course of disease or a particularly mild course of disease. Um, that will differ from um, infection to infection. Um, and that could suck for you to have the bad type of MHC for a particular microbe. But as a population, it's good because somebody has the right kind. There's no microbe that can kill us all because somebody is going to have the right combo of MHCs to present peptides to make a good T cell response. Yeah, Grace. Is the severity of the infection dependent on how tightly your T cell binds or is um, so one thing I'm saying, doing here is I am a little bit oversimplifying in that there are lots of reasons why there's differences in severity. Um, MHC is one piece of it, although it's, I think, a piece that people underestimate. It's pretty big. Um, the exact reason that, that the T-cell is a good or bad T-cell um, is something that people debate a lot. Affinity, which is what you're talking about, the strength of binding is one piece of it, but that's, there are some other pieces that people debate. Um, and so I talked about the idea that it's really important that we have this diversity amongst MHC in our population. I told you a little bit about the sweaty t-shirt experiment last time um, with the sort of, you know, people potentially preferring partners who have very different MHCs than them. Um, and I showed you data like this where we looked at the idea that different HLA types um, could give you different outcomes with the same infection. And so here we see slow or rapid progression to AIDS following infection with HIV and high or low amounts of virus. Um, and so really this is just data giving you an example of what I showed you before, that certain MHC types um, are going to be better or worse for you with certain infections. And so you might say, well, I wish I had HLA-B27 because B27 is particularly really good for, um, you know, a good outcome if we get HIV. You might think, man, I wish everyone in the population had HLA B27. That would be great. But there are lots of other diseases that are associated. Um, HLA B27 is going to be particularly bad for some microbes. HLA B27 also um, tends to make people have a um, increased likelihood of having particular autoimmune diseases, perhaps because they can present a self-peptide to get autoimmune disease really well with their HLA-B27. So every individual HLA type kind of has its pros and its cons. There's, for every single one you look at, there are things that people are sort of predisposed to bad outcomes, predisposed to good outcomes. Um, and so what you can see on this table is just a bunch of different kind of autoimmune disorders and different HLAs that are, e that are particularly associated with them. And so you can see that HLA is associated with a number of autoimmune diseases. Um, in fact, this is from a review in 2012. And this is a list of diseases where people have done genetics studies and come up with the answer that HLA is an important gene. And sometimes I laugh at some of these studies because there's a, uh, there'll be a study where someone will spend millions of dollars doing this really intense genetic study to find out what genes are important for blah, blah, blah disease. And it's a disease that we already knew is an immune system disease. And then the answer is they get HLA. And my answer is, congratulations, Captain Obvious. Like, we all already knew HLA was important if it was an immune disease. Sometimes we come up with diseases that we would have said we never would have thought were related to the immune system. So, like, schizophrenia comes up with an HLA association. Or um, what else might I not have expected? Uh, maybe Parkinson's. Or, you know, so there are sometimes where what will happen is people will do these types of things and be like, oh, I guess that the immune system is playing a role in that that we didn't know about. Um, but a lot, pretty much almost all disease states do have some um, association with uh, HLA types. 
Um, I told you before I had some fun facts about MHC, and I can't not tell you the fun facts because I really like the fun facts. Um, so one thing I will point out is that if we look at different populations around the world, the um, frequencies of different HLA types vary among different groups. Um, a lot of this has to do with things like founder effects and genetic drift of early members of that population. Um, but that does mean that we might see different severities of different infectious diseases among different populations because of the likelihood or uh, of different um, uh, groups to have different uh, HLA types. Um, this is actually used in a number of different settings. So there are lots of situations um, where people will do HLA typing and compare it to other populations to try to figure out what's going on. When you see things like some of those, you know, crime scene investigations, that the DNA from the killer is has a one in however many thousand chance of being the same as this other person, it's because they did HLA typing. And they were checking, does the HLA type match? And how? what's the probability of that kind of matching? You can do it. HLA typing works really well for things like paternity testing. Um, there is a, There was a really famous anthropological study of some people who were in, who lived on certain Pacific islands. And there were questions of how exactly their ancestors had gotten to those Pacific islands. Had they sort of come this direction or had they come this direction? And the way that the anthropologists actually figured that out was they did HLA typing and figured out which populations they were most closely related to of others. And so HLA typing can be used is used for all sorts of things genetically because it is such a nice, unique individual fingerprint. Um, because we have this nice polymorphism. And I, I've mentioned today and I mentioned last time the importance of um, population level diversity. Why it's important that these are the most polymorphic genes in the genome. And so the last sort of set of fun facts I want to tell you about is what happens, what would happen if our MHC genes were not super diverse among our population? There are a few examples we know of in nature where an organism, so of course these have to be examples in a type of vertebrate, because we're talking about vertebrate immunity here. There are some examples where we know that there are organisms whose MHCs are not diverse in this sort of ideal way. So I want to tell you about two sort of organisms who do not have diverse MHC and what the consequence seems to be in those organisms. One of those organisms uh, are cheetahs. So here you can see some of the pictures of cheetahs from going to um, cheetah rescue in South Africa. Um, and sometimes people know some stuff about cheetahs and what's up with cheetahs. So is there anything that you guys know about cheetahs? Um, and the cheetahs are quite endangered and sort of why they might be endangered or what's going on with cheetahs and being endangered? Yeah. OK. So, so there are problems with deforestation, but what the biggest issue with cheetahs is that their population got really small at some point, in, and that may very well be related to deforestation. And so there became very few cheetahs. As a result, almost all the cheetahs are genetically similar or are genetically identical, because they're all progeny of the same, like, two individuals, I don't know how many individuals it is, but it was a small number. So cheetahs are, have a super genetically similar population. And if you look in like an intro bio book, it will tell you, well, cheetahs, cheetahs have, have gone through this genetic bottleneck. They don't have a lot of genetic diversity. Their population is very um, at risk because they don't have much genetic diversity. Specifically, they actually, the problem with cheetahs is that they don't have MHC diversity. All the cheetahs have basically the same MHC type. What that means is that it is possible for there to be a microorganism that could infect and kill all the cheetahs. It is possible that if there was a cheetah pandemic, 
all the cheetahs could get wiped out if it happens to be the microbe that is bad for that type of MHC. Um, and so, in fact, when we go to cheetah rescue, we have to do a lot in terms of um, disinfection before we are allowed to get near the cheetahs um, because we are specifically trying to protect them from infectious disease um, in, uh, because of that MHC, um, that lack of MHC diversity. So that's one of the famous examples of lack of MHC diversity. But then there is the other example. This example is really, really sad, but also I have I find it so much fun. Um, so this is a Tasmanian devil. Um, and this is from a different immunology textbook, this picture of the Tasmanian devil. But I really like this picture. I think this is a key, important Tasmanian devil picture to show you. Because if you look at the this Tasmanian devil in this picture, what do you imagine might happen if we like push play? Like if this was a video and it's paused and we push play, what do you think is happening in this in this picture with this Tasmanian devil? Yeah. He's maybe doing some sort of threat display. What's he gonna do next? And what, what's he gonna do when he attacks? Bite. He's gonna bite you. Doesn't if you look at this, you're like. My conclusion from this picture is that Tasmanian devils are very bitey animals. <laughs> Can you see how we could get that conclusion from this picture? And that is actually really true. If you go to the Wikipedia page about Tasmanian devils, it like, uses the word bite a ridiculous number of times because many of their interactions with each other involve biting. Like They bite each other all the time. Biting is like their thing to do. Constantly. Bite, 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 bite. And particularly that sometimes they bite each other in the face. So I like this because here you can you really think about that Tasmanian devil biting. Now, I have to kind of give you a little bit of an example right now of something. And you're going to laugh at me when I tell you this. But I promise I got a reason for this. Let's imagine I had a terrible skin tumor on my hand, okay? Just absolutely terrible coming off my hand. And I walked over and I wiped my hand on Grace. Would Grace get cancer for me doing that? So you're, you're all shaking your head no. Why not? Yeah? But I just gave her cells that, that, so these cells on my hand reproduce out of control and have no, nothing stopping them from reproducing. So I, and I wipe them on Grace. Are, they're not going to give her cancer? Even though, why not? So, so you're, so usually people are like, because that's not how cancer works. Or because the healthy cells will fight them off. In fact, the reason is because if that happened, Grace's immune system would recognize those cells as foreign, those my cancer cells as foreign, and kill them. You know, you can't transmit cancer that way, right? Like, you see how you see sort of the issue? Tasmanian doubles, at some point in time, had their population shrink um, a lot. And so again, Tasmanian devils are really, really, really inbred. Pretty much all Tasmanian devils, I think there are three different MHC types in, in Tasmanian devils. Maybe only two MHC types in Tasmanian devils. And what has happened is that there some Tasmanian devil, sometime in the past, got a face tumor. And these animals spend a lot of their time biting, particularly biting each other in the face. And their MHCs are all the same. As a result, Tasmanian devils are actually probably going to go extinct um, because of a transmissible face tumor that is transmitting from Tasmanian devil to Tasmanian devil. 
um, that their immune systems cannot repel because they all have the same MHC. And so they are not recognized as foreign cells and they are actually staying on the Tasmanian devils um, and uh, leading to um, this tumor that very well may, like I said, um, make these animals go extinct. I mentioned that there are a couple different types of um, MHC in Tasmanian devils. There actually are two separate tumors with different MHC types. So basically everybody's susceptible to face tumor. Um, and it, it's pretty serious and pretty severe. Um, and so these are the types of things that we are protected from because we have such diverse MHCs in our population. And if something were to happen where we would not have those, um, those types of diverse MHCs in our population, then these types of issues would arise and become problematic for us. Um, so specifically, when we think about um, MHC and MHC diversity, we have to think a little bit about the genetics of MHC and MHC diversity. And one of the key reasons I have to talk about this is that as we talk about MHC and antigen presentation over the next few lectures, um, and as we talk about T cell responses, because of course T cell responses are related to MHC, I'm going to sort of phrase things with the correct nomenclature. <laughs> And that nomenclature actually tells you some things. And so sometimes, like when I give you a question on a problem set or when I give you a question on an exam, when I tell you some information about the MHC type, I'm actually giving you a lot of info if you know what the nomenclature means. So we have to talk a little bit about what some of that nomenclature means. And some people despise this, um, but I promise you it is actually pretty important. And it will, and even if you're like, it's not important for me ever after this class. It's important in this class because to understand certain problems fully, you need to know what I'm talking about. Um, so this is the part of the genome in humans that encodes the human MHC. And when we talk about the human MHC, we often refer to it as the HLA locus. So HLA means MHC in humans. Um, and it's because the people who discovered MHC in other animals and the people who discovered HLA didn't originally know they were studying the same thing. And they were using two, like, such different models. It's not a, you wouldn't have ever thought that you were studying the same thing. Um, this is on the short arm of chromosome 6, uh, as I mentioned to you last time. And on that region, we have three or on that, that short arm, we've got three regions, the class one, class two, and class three regions. Um, the class three region does not actually have things that we think of as MHC genes and MHC proteins. It just happens to be in the middle of this part of the genome. But the thing that is kind of interesting and important about it is that most of the genes that are there are related to the immune system. And so they're like, not MHC, but they're other immunologically important things. So for example, all of the complement proteins are encoded in genes there. Um, and a bunch of important cytokines um, and some other proteins uh, that are immunologically important are all there. So that's kind of just the reason to mention it. We're really not gonna say much more about it uh, in any other time. Then we also have the class one and the class two regions. The genes encoded in the class 1 region are called class 1 MHCs. The genes encoded in the class 2 region are called class 2 MHCs. And for human, the class 1 MHCs are known as... Oh, come on. Are known as, not writable, um, HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C. So if I ever tell you something about HLA-A, there are a couple things you know. One, because it has HLA in the name, it's something about human MHC. And because it's A, it's a class one. Um, alternatively, we have 
HLA DP, HLA DQ, HLA DR. Those are the MHC class twos in human. And you can see that after the HLA part, the class ones have one letter and the class twos have two letters. Um, we can also think about that variation that I mentioned to you before. So I told you that we all have different versions of these uh, proteins and these genes. And so we also can think about the nomenclature that we would use for the different versions. So we might call a version of HLA-A that I might have, we might call it HLA-A1. And if we looked at a different version that was perhaps, maybe I got HLA-A1 from one of my parents. And if we looked at a different version that I got from another one of my parents, it might be A2. And if I looked at a different version that somebody else in the class has, it might be 33. <laughs> the different versions are indicated by a number. Um, if you look at some of the literature now, there's this like number star system. I'm not getting that deep into it for us. I'm just going to say it's a number. <laughs> so you each have two HLAAs and they're some number. And if you really wanted to, you could go online and like get a list of all the HLAAs and like figure out which ones you had or things. But so that's what they are. That's how it works. Pretty straightforward, right? This makes a lot of sense. Um, one other thing to that I'll mention here, um, I'm probably going to come back to this at the end today. I'm just remembering how I organize the slides. Um, oftentimes when we talk about these and when we think about some aspects of um, MHC molecules, we also talk about this region of the genome as being what's known as the longest haplotype in the genome. Haplotype is a genetics term that means that you tend to have all of these alleles inherited together. So oops. If these are my two chromosomes from mom and dad, I might have A1, C3, B15, B27, C12, A3. I'm just making up random numbers. I just made up some numbers. <laughs> um, and if we looked at, say, a progeny of this person, they would probably pass on all of these together or all of these together on one chromosome. You're not going to see this person pass on B15 and C12 to their progeny. Their progeny is either going to get this, this combo or this combo. We don't tend to see as much mixing and matching um, here as we do in some other genes. That doesn't mean that there's no mixing and matching. So don't think that there's none. But there's a little bit less. And so you, whenever, if I'm asking you about like progeny at any point in time, you, can, you should be able to write out both chromosomes from like the parent or the child and kind of figure out which one came from where. Because you're going to be passing these down as whole chromosomes. Um, sometimes it helps people when I mention this idea of a haplotype. Is it's a bunch of genes that are usually inherited together. And I said this is the longest haplotype in the human genome. The second longest haplotype in the human genome, just for comparison's sake, sometimes this like makes it click for people, is the hair color, eye color, skin color haplotype. 
So that means that usually you can sort of, as a stereotype, think about super pale skin, blue eyes, and blonde hair going together, because those genes tend to be tend to be inherited together. Not all the time. Sometimes you can have somebody with super pale skin, blue eyes, and not blonde hair. Um, but though that's the second longest set of genes that tend to go together. So it's again, it's not 100%, and you can all think of examples of places where it's not 100%. But more often than not, you're seeing some of these genes traveling together. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is how we do the nomenclature in humans. We also have to talk about how we do the nomenclature in mice. And the reason why this is important is because most of the problems I'm going to give you when we think about um, MHC or T cells are going to have to do with mice. And so you're going to have to know what the nomenclature means to know what's up with mice. Um, people were doing, basically people were looking at weird proteins on the surface of blood cells in humans. So they were the human leukocyte antigens, or HLAs. In mice, they were doing um, experiments where they were crossing mice and then trying to transplant pieces of skin. So it was about skin transplantation. Why you would ever think fun proteins on human leukocytes and mouse skin transplants had anything to do with each other? That's why these things have weird, have totally different sets of names. And so they would do things like this. They would start out with um, two, with mice of two different strains. We might say this mouse is strain of this, is, has this little superscript B strain. What it means if a mouse is of a particular strain is that it is homozygous for some of those genes. So that means it's got two copies of B. So if I had to write out its chromosome from its mother and its chromosome from its father, I'd write out the same thing as B, because we have this inbred strain. This one is the K kind, so it's going to be K and K. So these are two completely genetically different strains, but their parents were genetically identical, and everybody in their lineage was of this strain. And that's been going on for lots of years. So they would do things like um, crosses, where they would take one mouse, say this orange one, that was of an inbred strain with totally known genetics, and one mouse like this yellow one of a totally inbred strain with known genetics, and they would cross them together. So they get this mouse that was genetically half orange or half B and half K. And if I were going to write out the, the write out genome things, I would know, well, like one chromosome has to be this kind and one chromosome has to be this kind because I know that's who the parents are from. And then they would do things like do skin transplants of patches of skin between all of these animals. And when they did that, they saw some interesting results. Please note, sometimes I, I talk about this information, and students take some really wacky things home from it. What I want you to know or to remember about these experiments is these experiments were done in inbred mice. The things I tell you that happen in these experiments in inbred mice will not necessarily happen in you because you are an outbred person, which means you, your parents are not like all genetically identical strains with both of their chromosomes all the same. So because you're outbred, this doesn't work for you, but it works for inbred mice. So what they found is that if they took the orange parent as a donor, they took a little piece of skin from that orange parent, and they gave it to another mouse, genetically identical orange, the skin transplant would work. They gave it to a completely different mouse, like the yellow mouse, the transplant wouldn't work. And if they gave it to the progeny, then in fact, it would work as well. This does not mean you can have a kidney from your mother, necessarily. It doesn't mean it's going to match perfectly. In, in red mice, it would. In you, it would, might not. <laughs> um, same thing, if we use the yellow parent, 
the yellow parent could donate to other yellow mice, could not donate to orange mice, and could also donate to the progeny. And the progeny could donate to more progeny who were both B and K, or both red, uh, orange, and yellow, but could not donate to either parent. And so the idea was that, okay, so in this one, this B is self, and this one's got B in it, so that works. Here, K is self, and K is part of that, so that's okay. But here, to be self, you have to have both B and K, and it won't work to go into either parent. And um, experimenters did more and more complex um, genetic crosses and transplants to try to figure out what was the gene that was important here for the matching. So they were just doing all these different crosses and then skin transplants. And they were specifically trying to understand if the, um, they're thinking about compatibility of the skin. And skin is a type of tissue. So when, if you think about anatomy and physiology, is there a word that sometimes comes up when we think about tissues? Like, what's the study of tissues? Like under a microscope. What? Histology. So usually histo tends to be something about tissue. And so they called this the histo compatibility locus. Tish, are the tissues compatible or not? As a result, they didn't call it the human leukocyte antigen nor did they call it the mouse leukocyte antigen. They didn't have any idea that it had anything to do with leukocytes at this point. They just knew it had something to do with histocompatibility. And for reasons that I don't actually know the answer to, they called this locus H2. I know that H is for histocompatibility. I don't know why there's a 2. So instead of saying HLA whatever, if you see something that says H2 whatever, you that should signal to you we are talking about mouse MHC. And this is the H2 locus in the mouse. It's not chromosome 6, it's chromosome 17, but that really doesn't matter for your purposes. Just like in humans, there's a class 1, a class 2, and a class 3 region. The class 1 technically is like split. Whenever I draw it for you, I'm not going to draw it split because I'm lazy. The class 3 region is, oh my gosh, complement and other proteins of immunologic importance. The class 1 region are class 1 MHCs. The class 2 region are class 2 MHCs. But again, they have slightly different names. So the MHC class 1s are known as H2K, H2D, and H2L. While the class 2s are H2IA and h 2 I. So when you see H2, there should be an alarm bell in your mind, just like that alarm that's going to go off on all our phones at 2.20, that says mouse MHC is what we're talking about here. If then there you see a K, a D, or an L written like this, that should tell you we mean class 1. If you say IA or IE, that means class 2. Note that again, happily, Class 1s are one letter, and class 2s are two letters. Um, and I'll just draw out KDL. Yes, I'm not going to split them because, like I said, I'm lazy. So there is the sort of my mouse's two chromosomes from its mom and its dad. Just like with humans, we could give names to the versions of the mouse's uh, particular which K, which version of K does this mouse have? 
which version of D, which version of L. Just like we said that I might have A1 and A3, we could figure out what version it is for the mouse. The problem is that the way we name versions here is not with numbers. It's a way that people find really wacky. Everyone hates. <laughs> but realize it's the same parallel of what the number is doing in the case of human. Um, the way that this was worked out was that we named these versions based on having found them in different groups of mice. So, for example, some researchers use the black six mouse, C57 black six. And somebody sequenced the genome of the black six mouse. And remember, the black six mouse is totally inbred. So it's chromosome from its mom and chromosome from its dad look the same. So it only has one version of K. It just has two copies of it and one D and one L. And we just picked a name for those. And we picked the name B. <laughs> That's one I can remember easily because I remember B is for black, and those are the black six mice. And so I know that C57 black six mice are what are known as of the H2, uh, the H2B haplotype, like this. So you can see how I write H2B like this. That means if I see that nomenclature, that means I know that the versions of L this mouse has is called L of B. And the version of D is D of B. And the version of K is K of B. And the version of IE is IE of B. The version of IA is IA of B. So if I just see the word H2B, I know that I could write out the chromosomes to look like this. And I know that if I went to the New York City subway and caught a mouse and she sequenced its genome and I found that it had this K, the same exact kind of K, I would call it K of B. And it was K of B was defined as the version of K that these mice have. Similarly, I spent a lot of time in graduate school using a mouse called um, a Balb C mouse. Um, the Balb C is written out here. Balb C mice are of the H2D haplotype. So if I were If I told you that, oh yeah, my mouse was is of the H2D haplotype, how could I expand out to know what all of its genes are? What L does it have right here on this chromosome? Hmm? It has L of D. What L does it have here on this chromosome? L of D. How about this D? D. K of D. K of D. I have. So if I sell you, tell you something like, here, and this is something about H2D of D. It's the, basically the equivalent of me saying, this is something about HLA-A1. It's a particular type of MHC and a, type of, and a particular version. It is possible that if I caught a mouse in the New York City subway and I sequenced its genome, possible if I sequence a genome, I could find out, well, it has, from its father, it got the K version that was in black six, so it got K of B. And from its mother, it got the version of K that's from this mouse, K of D. And from, um, so it, from one parent, it got this one, and maybe it got this one, and then, oh, here it also got a D, and here it got a B, and here it got a 
S, and here I got a T, and I think there are W's. I don't have W's on that thing. Um, so it could be like a totally mix and match version if I pick an animal from the wild that isn't part of like an inbred strain that has been worked on genetically in the lab. Like it would be sort of this weird mix and match of different versions, just like the human one is, where it's just some rando number. So they don't have to match. But in the case of many of our strains, they will match and we have a shorthand in the case that they do match. Um, and so you will see this nomenclature throughout a lot of the problems. There are going to be, there are some problems in that problem set that you know enough to answer right now, and a lot of it is about the nomenclature. If you start looking at those problems, even though they're not due for more than a week, I think it's a Friday after break, and you're like, I don't know what these words mean, come talk to me. Happy to talk to you. Um, so that's kind of the general MHC genetics information that I wanted to tell you about. Um, but I also want to, we need to talk about kind of the MHC protein itself and its function and its details. And so for the rest of the time today, my goal is to talk about kind of what this protein looks like and some of the specific details of its sort of structure and how it does its function. The goal for Friday is to talk about how we break up this peptide and get it into the MHC. So, and that's called the presentation pathway. So the goal is Friday we'll do the presentation, how we get this from here to here. And today we're just going to talk about what the structure of this looks like for the rest of the time. Um, so I need to give you some very basic biochemistry <laughs> here. Um, specifically, I want to just remind you of a couple things and point out a couple terms that I will use for some of the other pieces. So remember, we're going to be talking about um, when we talk about MHC, I told you that we can only present proteins or peptides. And so specifically, it's important for us to think about proteins or peptides. Peptides or proteins come together because they have amino acids. So we have different amino acids that are going to come together to make different uh, proteins. And so you can see two amino acids here. They're going to get linked together. We have our amino terminus and our carboxy terminus, or N and our C terminus. They're getting linked together to make this big long chain. You can also see that each of our amino acids has um, an R group labeled as just R. The R group is different for different amino acids. So sometimes I'm going to talk about the R group. And the R group is whatever is coming off of this carbon here. I'm also from time to time going to talk about the backbone or the main chain atoms. When I mention the backbone or the main chain atoms, I mean this NCC, 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 NCC part that's not the R groups. And so what I want you to realize about that main chain is that no matter what protein we're talking about, it's always NCC, 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 and it's identical. The main chain is always the same, no matter what protein we're talking about. The place where things vary is in the R groups. There are 20 major amino acids, and the place they all differ from each other are in the R groups, which are shown here. What I want you to think, to realize most about those R groups is that they differ a lot in size, shape, and charge. And so we are going to think about those pockets in MHC proteins, and we might see differences in the pocket in terms of, so, in terms of kind of, is it a pocket that area that's really big or really small? If it's really big, it probably fits a big R group. If it's really small, it only fits a small R group. If you can also imagine differences in if there's a charge or not, which R groups it could fit, or um, you know polarity and that which R groups it could fit, and so notice some of the variation we see in some of these R groups, um, and realize that that will change what shape best matches them. Oftentimes, as an example, 
I like to use um, lysine because it's long and skinny and has a charge at the end. So lysine is a frequent example of mine. Um, where is it? Phenylalanine that I phenylalanine is another pretty big example because it has it's round. So this one's long and skinny, and this one's big and bulky and round. Um, and if it's tyrosine, it's big, bulky, and round, and has an OH, so it has a charge too. Um, versus something like, say, glycine that just has a hydrogen, so it, it's really little. And so you could imagine the big, bulky, round, the long, skinny, and the little, tiny are going to each need three different sizes of pockets. And so I might mention those in my um, as examples. You'll also notice that with the R groups, um, each amino acid has a one letter abbreviation. I mean, I'll just think about one letter abbreviations for these a lot. So there might be times where I'm writing just one letter abbreviations. Um, it, this isn't biochem. You're not expected to like know what they all mean. But if you ever want a reference, that's this is a reference for you. Um, so I've told you um, some things about MHC genetics. But in order to dive into more details about the proteins, one of the first things I have to t mention is that we've talked about the idea of there being a class one region and a class two region, and class one genes and class two genes. The class one MHCs and the class two MHCs are super different in most of their biological functions and in their structure and in other things. And so pretty much for the rest of the time we're talking about MHC, we're going to be specifically MHC class one or MHC class two. This goes back to the genetics and is going to tie into all of the other things that we're talking about. Um, and so here are the structures of MHC class one and MHC class two. I'm going to sort of zoom in on a bunch of details about class one right now. And so we're going to be thinking about class one for a while. Um, we, uh, depending on time, I'll either finish class two today or finish it on Friday. Um, but notice they both have a pocket. They are both MHC class one and MHC class two. They both contain two protein chains in addition to the peptide. So the peptide is the red dot in either case. In both cases, we've got two protein chains. Class two, one of them's orange, one of them's yellow. Um, class one, there's sort of this big yellow one and this little one. One thing that does actually matter quite a bit, um, you will see this on further slides, but I want to point it out here as well because it's a nice compare and contrast right here. Notice that class one has one transmembrane domain. It only passes through the membrane once. So this big yellow part passes through the membrane. This little yellow part does not. You can also note that this little yellow part isn't actually touching anything. It's not covalently linked to any other pieces here. Whereas class two, you can see the two transmembrane domains. Um, and you can see kind of that these two parts are, these are really two separate proteins. You can also see that some of these are drawn as nice little rectangles. Those nice little rectangles are the immunoglobulin domains that we've seen before. So that is that same protein structure we've seen before. I am very, very nervous whenever I do this lecture because my first year ever teaching when I was a TA, I drew some MHC molecules on the board and it looked like the most inappropriate thing I have ever drawn on the board and it was really bad. And so now I'm like afraid to draw this. Um, but you will notice there are sometimes where I will ask you specific questions about the structure of them. And so knowing things like whether or not we're thinking about covalent linkages, whether or not we have transmembrane domains are some of the key things to think about. So here is our MHC class one molecule because we're gonna zoom in just on class one for now. Um, this is another version of that immunoglobulin domain, this little circle-y thing that's blue with the two S's, the disulfide bond. So here you can see we've got an immunoglobulin domain. Then we've got these two other domains that don't have that nice structure as part of this one big protein that also has a transmembrane domain. 
And those are known as the alpha-1, alpha-2, and alpha-3 domains. Alpha-1 and alpha-2 are not immunoglobulin domains, but they come together to make this peptide binding pocket. Alpha-3 is this sort of bottom structural domain um, that has a transmembrane domain. And then our MHC class 1 molecule pairs with a partner protein that's called beta-2 microglobulin, or beta-2M. Every single MHC, so I told you about this, a massive diversity of MHCs we have, they all use the same beta-2M. Um, and it is non-covalently linked either with a transmembrane domain, and it's also non-covalently linked here. That's important because it does actually have an on-off rate. Um, MHC class 1 only folds correctly like this when it has a peptide in the groove and when it has beta 2M. And MHC class 1 almost like breathes because there's a little bit of an on-off rate. And when if, if beta 2M comes off, it unfolds and loses the peptide. And then it's like, oh, wait, and it catches it and comes back. So there's a little bit of a like breathing <laughs> that you can imagine happening because of that non-covalent interaction. Um, you'll notice that these sort of bottom sort of structural parts are mostly beta sheets. And at the top, we've got sort of some beta sheets with alpha helices on top. And so it's almost like a little beta sheet platform with two alpha helices on either side of the groove. Um, and you can see that that groove in more detail here. So now you are the T cell and you are looking at MHC class one plus peptide. Um, so you can see there is this little platform of beta sheets at the bottom, and then there are these two alpha helices at the top. One of them is part of the alpha-1 domain. One of them is part of the alpha-2 domain. The peptide, which is shown over here in orange, is sort of held in between those two, um, those two alpha helices. There is something else that's super important. So this is like an old version of a picture from a textbook, and I will never stop using this version because it's something really important they show, and it makes me mad that other textbooks took it out. Um, what you should notice here is that the alpha-1 and the alpha-2 helices come together pretty tightly at the ends. And so the ends of this pocket are closed. The peptide can't be as long as it wants to be. If, if you had a peptide that was really long, it wouldn't fit in there. There's a, there's a limit to the length of that peptide in class one and class two, and it's because we have closed ends on the pocket. Specifically, the MHC class one pocket can hold a peptide of between eight and 10 amino acids. And when I say that, it's really usually either 8, 9, or 10. So like K of B might bind 8s, and K of D might bind 9s. But it's always either 8, 9, or 10 if it's a class 1. That's it. The other thing, so this is a version of this from sort of from your textbook. I'm going to show you a similar image on the next slide from another textbook to make the same point is that if you actually look at that pocket or that binding groove or what's called here the cleft, the cleft is making interactions with the R groups on the peptides. So the when the MHC peptide is binding into the pocket, the things that it's actually looking for or binding to are the R groups. And you can see that here as well. So you can imagine these little shapes are those R groups of the different shapes I showed you before. The pocket is going to have corresponding little shapes to bind to those R groups. They aren't all going to point down towards the pocket. Only some of them are. Like here, perhaps it's numbers two and seven. Um, and those are going to lock the peptide into the pocket. The rest of the peptide will be up so the T cell can see it. And those individual uh, amino acids whose R groups are really binding to this pocket are known as the anchor residues. 
So in MHC class one, we have anchor residues that are have specific amino acids whose R groups fit the pocket perfectly. And the MHC class one molecule can only present peptides if they have the right R groups in the right places in or, uh, to match sort of the anchor residue for that type of MHC. Um, and so you can see this here as well. This is a pretty cool experiment. Um, some people took some MHC molecules. They took two different kinds. You could imagine this being like K of B and K of D or A1 and A3, whatever. They took two different MHC class ones and they did some experiments where they pulled all the peptides out of them. And when they pulled all the peptides out of version number one, they found that they were all super different, except they all had a leucine or isoleucine at position nine. They all had a proline at three, and um, they all had a G at position two, right? And so they said, aha, for this MHC type, the anchor residues are G at 2, P at 3, I or L at 9. And the pocket must have a shape that those particular R groups fit really nicely. And then they looked at a different kind of MHC, and they said, aha, and this one is either isoleucine or valine, um, and it has to be a tyrosine at Y. And so they said, Okay, so that the anchor residues here are tyrosine at position two, isoleucine or valine at position nine. Um, and um, that probably is what the shape of the pocket is like, and that helped them understand what was going on with the anchor residues. I'll also tell you the pocket. Remember how I mentioned that the ends were closed of the pocket? The pocket ends also are usually charged. So usually one end is negatively charged so that it can bind to the positive that's on the, the um, amino terminus. And one is positive, so it combines the negative of the carboxy terminus. Um, you can actually kind of see that here too. Technically, we should also have some charges in here to correctly interact with the N and C uh, termini. Um, one other reason why this experiment is important is that the two people who did this experiment, this was actually their undergraduate thesis, though it was like in the 70s. Um, so um, I always find that stuff interesting. So here's just another example about anchor residues. Um, so for any particular MHC type, there's going to be some particular motif that tends to bind to that. And any peptide that happens to meet those criteria will bind and be presented by that MHC type. Um, ideally, um, you know, every microbe will have some peptide that binds to your MHC type. So you'll be able to make some kind of response. But exactly which one will be a bit different. So that's one really important thing about MHC class one is the eight to 10 amino acids. We have anchor residues because the pocket is binding to our groups. Um, the pocket ends are closed. But it's also important that when we actually see how the peptides get onto the MHC, we can find out that MHC molecules get their peptides from different places. And when we're talking about MHC class one, MHC class one specifically gets its proteins or its peptides from the cytoplasm. So these are proteins that were found in the cytoplasm. So we've got some kind of protein in the cytoplasm that's going to make its way onto MHC class one. Um, Emma asked in a past time whether there was something about CD8 T cells in class one and um, viruses versus bacteria. And here's where that comes in. Viruses reproduce in the cytoplasm a lot of the time. So their proteins are frequently found in the cytoplasm. So viruses are often targeted by MHC class one. What can we do to a virus infected cell? Can we like cure it? What, what's the best thing for us to do to a virus infected cell? If we want to save the body, yeah. So, so we might want to have an antiviral state um, for, but really that that's going to the neighboring not infected cells. What are we going to do about that infected cell if we want to save our body? Do you want, what are you going to do? You're going to kill that cell. And so, in fact, MHC class one 
is looking for cytoplasmic peptides. And MHC class 1 specifically presents to a CD8 T cell, which is the killer kind of T cell, so that we can kill something with this bad peptide in its cytoplasm. So class 1 is presenting cytoplasmic peptides, is presenting specifically to cytotoxic or CD8 T cells. Oh, I'm really going there. Oh, yeah, I'm going there. Um, I'll give you a hint because I'm going. We're going to see more of this on Friday. Class one presents to CD8 T cells. You'll see on Friday that class two presents to CD4 T cells. If you multiply the numbers together, you always get eight. Eight times one is eight, and four times two is eight. So CD4 class two presents to CD4s. Class one presents to CD8s. So that's your mnemonic: is multiplying always gives you eight for this. Um, and we'll finish talking about class one and class two structures next time, and we will get into presentation. I may be a little bit behind, but you will cer still certainly be ready what you need with the paper um, by the day after break. So we'll work, make it work. Um, so I'll see you guys. Have a great next couple days.